Christians and Jews worship the same God, share parts of the same Bible, and in fact claim Jesus in different ways. We'll be talking with Rabbi David Stern about some of those similarities and differences on Good God. Stay tuned. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm your host, George Mason, and I'm delighted to welcome to the program today, Rabbi David Stern. David. Hello, George. We are so glad to have you. <laughs> David is the senior rabbi of Temple Emmanuel uh, here in Dallas, a, a congregation in the Reformed Jewish movement. Uh, in fact, David, you've just come off of two years of leading the rabbinical group uh, nationwide, and so uh, I'm sure you're taking a deep breath right now. Happy to be home. Yes, I'll Happy bet that's be right. Home. It's been a lot of travel. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, uh, I, I think one of the things I'd like to start with is just a recognition that <laughs> you and I have been here a long time together. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is 30 years for both of us uh, that we've been uh, Part of, part of our congregations, uh, you first as associate rabbi and then as senior rabbi. But here we are three decades together and we've walked uh, quite an interesting path where um, been, been lots of opportunities for us to uh, uh, you know, work together in the community, speak in different ways, and uh, it's been one of the most rewarding things for me uh, across time. So, a huge uh, blessing thank in my you. life, a huge blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so what reflections do you have uh, in 30 years of being uh, the leader of a congregation in Dallas, Texas, a place that many people might say is traditionally sort of the buckle of the Bible belt, right? Uh, and, uh, and yet Temple Emmanuel is an incredibly vital congregation, uh, doing so much uh, both within and, and then also without in the community. Uh, how do you reflect back on these years? Well, I think that in terms of our shared work, mm -hmm. the gift of having a partner in the journey mm -hmm. who can reflect back honestly yeah. in terms of theology, in terms of stances in the public square, in terms of the language we use and the impact it has, this mm -hmm. friendship and partnership has been invaluable to me. I don't know how you feel about it, but when I look back on the 30 years, especially in terms of the public square part, right. there are parts of our jobs that get easier yes. year after year because we get better at it and because the relationships right. deepen and because forgiveness broadens for when we mess up. <laughs> yeah. But I think the work in the public square is harder now than it was when we started. Yeah. I think that the politicization and the polarization of almost every utterance and syllable of speech not necessarily that we have intended it that way, but because it is perceived that way. Wait, that happens to you too? No, oh, very rarely. <laughs> yes, of right? course, because yeah. your congregation all agrees yeah, all the exactly. time, right? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uniformity is our byword. So I think, I think that the, not just within our communities, but we know what's happening out there in the world. And right. I think that the challenge to us as faith leaders to, and that's why I'm so grateful for forums like Good God, right. the challenge to us as faith leaders to articulate values propositions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to have those be trans-political, right. and to have them be heard and understood and felt that way, to be mm -hmm. genuine mm -hmm. in our advocacy for diversity and not just right. have that be lip service hoping that everyone agrees with us. Right. I think those are challenges to us as individuals, as faith leaders, to our communities, because we know that if we shut down, mm -hmm. if out of fear or concern we say, oh, it's not worth it because everything will immediately be polarized and become toxic, therefore I'm not going to weigh in, well then I think we've started to fail in our mission and fail in our faith. It's not ancillary yes. to this calling. Right. It's central to this calling. Right. And if we treat it as sort of trimmable, well, trimmable is what I think many people would prefer in the pew in that uh, they sense that every single day, every time they turn on the news, and even in their families and personal relationships, uh, every conversation has an edge. Yeah. It's about what you think about the president, what you, how you feel about the Congress, what's your position on immigration, what's your view of Israel, what's your, oh my goodness, it just, and then we, we carve up our relationships all week long, and then we come to our congregations for our weekly services. 
and people are saying, can I have a break? Yes. Can I find some peace with God? And I get that. Yes. I mean, I truly do understand that. And yet, here we are, um, if, if we think about the lineage of our role and extending back into our biblical texts and our fo spiritual forebears, they, they never made such a distinction between the spiritual and the earthly, you might say, the everyday. In fact, uh, their their deepest concerns was in the way uh, was about the way we treat one another. Correct. And this is what politics is, isn't Correct. it? Correct. It's about our life together. Correct. And I think that the your point about people wanting to find haven and sanctuary mm -hmm. is valid. Right. And that need is valid. Mm -hmm. And we can't ignore that. Right. But we can't let ourselves be limited to that either. It's not we're not simply there to be a salve for people. Yes. And I think that the to me what's the what justifies whatever we might choose to do and whatever we might choose to do can only be justified by a sense of respect mm -hmm. for the interlocutor, for the listener, for the congregant, yes. whoever it might be. And I think when that comes through Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it makes everybody happy, right? but when that comes through, that means that we are understanding the brokenheartedness of everyone with whom we speak. Yes. And we do recognize the imperative for our communities to be places of healing. Mm -hmm. But they can't be places of healing just for ourselves. Right. They have to be forces of healing for the society too. Right, and, and if, if we went to a doctor because we had an ailment, and uh, the doctor said, you know, I, I, I know that we need surgery or we need to address this, but it's going to be painful, so I know you probably don't want me to. So, you know, well, obviously, right. you know, that, that we would consider that malpractice. Yes, right. right. So, but, but I do think it's interesting, you're, you're talking about how we, we actually do hold people in our hearts and minds when we prepare ourselves to speak, and to act in spiritual leadership roles because, and this, this is true in the congregation, but it's also true in our wider relationships. Uh, an example of that would be, you know, because of our friendship over time, I have a sense, I sort of know, I think, what matters to you, yes, you do. what hurts you, mm -hmm. what would challenge me if from you, if I uh, took a position uh, that that you know might be different or might be be challenging in in our relationship or in our religious traditions, and because of these relationships, the deeper we have these relationships, the more thoughtful and careful we are, not necessarily to compromise our own convictions, but but to account for one another because said. the relationships matter so deeply. Right, and it's not done out of, with a, with a congregation, certainly in your leadership and I aspire to in mine, that's done out of love for the other, not right. out of sort of self-protective, anxious caution. Right, I'm right. not sort of right. trying to get away with something or trying yes. to figure out how to say something or try to have it be inoffensive. Right. I'm trying to have regard That's right. for the people with whom I speak. And I think, for me, the through line, or a through line is, and it's why relationship is so important. If you and I show up for people in full heart mm -hmm. in their times of need and pain, whether that be the kind of pain that lands you in the hospital or the kind of pain that lands you in the pastor's office, right, right. When I show up, or you show up then, for the immigrant in El Paso, mm -hmm. there's a better chance that a congregant sees the through line of care. Yes. This is the same heart and the same gesture and the same engine that took place in your office. Right. And they may have a political objection but if we're doing our jobs right on the relationship level, they will get, I think, they, there's a chance that they will get. Well, let's say there's a higher probability that they'll get. A higher probability. Because 
I, I think it is true, and I can name people in our congregation for whom that is absolutely true. The loyalty and the sort of stickiness of relationship goes beyond philosophical differences, political uh, conflict, or whatever the case may be. But it is also true that one of the more painful things about our work is when that's not true. Correct. Is Correct. when uh, we have this emotional and spiritual bank of experience with people, and we think that the deposits are there and can be withdrawn during times when we really knock heads or disagree. And then people move banks. Yes. Uh, they, they walk down the street, right. and in our culture, um, everything is about choice. Right. And, and, the, and it's painful for everyone. It's painful for everyone. It's painful for them. It's painful mm -hmm. for us, and we've both experienced it, and it's probably one of the hardest things we deal with. But it does also go to an interesting thing, I think, David, uh, of the American religious ethos, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So both of our traditions are rooted in an assumption, both Christianity and Judaism, an assumption that the community is a covenantal people, mm -hmm. and it comes first. Yes. Uh, but our American ethos, the individual comes first. Correct. You know, and when we've transferred that into our uh, congregational and religious life, it becomes more transactional than covenantal. Yes. And this is one of the biggest challenges I think we feel in ministry, isn't it? Correct. And then if you, I 100% I agree. And then if, although I have to say, that within both of our traditions also, there is an ongoing, I think, vital and ultimately salutary, but there is an ongoing tension between the individual and the communal. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? We are, there's a, I recently saw an article about the change in American political culture in the use of the term responsibility. Oh, really? And I think it would actually fit your mm -hmm. spiritual frame also. At what, and it may not be a chronological marker, but let's just say at what point, at what point does the culture shift from understanding responsibility as my responsibility towards another mm -hmm. to the kind of personal responsibility that we started to hear about in the 1980s, yes. that is someone is not deserving of another person's support unless they are acting responsibly. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And at what point does that become sort of a box that I have to check mm. in order to be deserving. Mm -hmm. And at what point is it, as you say, a covenantal obligation right. that the community has, yes. regardless of what the person gets on their deservingness report card? Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, th this goes back to you know roots of our ethical um, mandates in our traditions. Uh, that uh, these are not guidelines for behavior. They right. are expectations right. of right. how, you know, when, when you look at the Ten Words, for instance, the Ten Commandments, w what you're talking about here are not boxes to check for the individual. It's about the protection of the community, isn't it? Correct. It's, a, it's about the nature of our life together and the way we live in the world as people of God. Right, but what I'll give you as the tension yes. is, so at least if we take the, the mm -hmm. biblical context, mm -hmm. here are these um, pronouncements mm -hmm. that are offered to, that are commanded to the totality of the community gathered at Mount Sinai, Yes. yet in the grammar they're each offered in the singular. True. So I believe that that dance mm -hmm. is ongoing. Yeah, yeah. Because ultimately the health of the community is gonna depend upon individual choice. Right. But we can't that let that lapse into mm -hmm a self-absorbed individualism. Well, and this, this goes to even, you know, when, when Jesus was wandering about uh, in, in his uh, ministry years, he was always addressing people personally mm -hmm. and saying, if, if any want to be my follower, let them take up their own cross mm -hmm. and follow me. Right. Let them deny themselves, take up their cross. In fact, oddly enough, Leave father and mother, yeah. um, you know, become part of this new community. And there's, I think, you know, some 
uh, allusion back to uh, Elisha and you know some of that. Should I can I go back first and right. you know these sorts of things? But uh, but there is, a, as you say, a call to come to this new community uh, that's that's being formed uh, of disciples. But it's a personal call. It's an individual call. Well, let's pick up that uh, when we come back from the break. Great, Thanks. thank you. The Good God Program is a project of Faith Commons, a nonprofit organization I founded in 2018 to help promote the common good. Doing public theology across faith traditions and across racial and ethnic lines is an important thing today in our communities. We hope you'll continue to enjoy Good God, but look at some of the other things we're doing also through Faith Commons at www.faithcommons.org. We're back with David Stern. David, we were talking about personal responsibility and the community, and I want to maybe extend that a little bit and, and, and talk about the fact that you and I have frequently through the years been asked to talk about religious liberty in public forums, yep. um, places where we would articulate this notion of the separation of church and state, the First Amendment's protection of religious minorities, and that grows out of, uh, for both of us, uh, a minority consciousness of religion in America. The First Amendment being owed to this idea that um, people who are not the dominant religious culture should be respected equally and have complete freedom. Uh, and, and, and so uh, it, it seems to me that there's a strength both in uh, Judaism, uh, which represents what, about 2% of the population, Ish, roughly, yep. in, in the U.S., and, uh, and, and, and our, our historic Baptist tradition uh, that I try to represent, uh, which in early America was not part of the established colonies and were, was always being persecuted. Right. So as we maintain that sense of our minority place religiously, there's, it, it's easier to defend everyone else's religious place as well, right? Yeah. Um, but we, we seem to have a problem, Baptists certainly, when we became dominant in the South, mm -hmm. when we became mm -hmm. uh, more of the cultural uh, default, uh, and where we had um, a, a sort of um, hegemony in uh, communities and culture, the mayor was on the third pew, and the, son, the school superintendent, and the county judge, and all that sort of thing. This is true even in Israel with Jews. For the first time in the state of Israel, in uh, modern uh, life, now a, a dominant religious uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, what happens, do you think, to us when we, when we move from this responsibility for our neighbor because we understand the need for our neighbor to be responsible to us to this majority position? Well, it's a fascinating question. To me, it's a question about how to hold power justly. Good. Some scholars argue that the Torah, the first five books and certainly beyond them, but the first five books of the Hebrew Bible constitute an exilic document, mm -hmm. that they were composed and certainly redacted in exile, and that yes. exilic sensibility, right. some would argue, is reflected in every core Jewish ethic. Right. I, don't want, I don't quite see it as an accident of history, mm -hmm. but I do see consistency right. between an exilic mentality, which right. we could argue is a minority mentality, yes. a sub-power mentality, right? right? Right. And the kind of ethos that's articulated in the scripture that we share. Yes. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So um, there are a couple of attendant risks, it seems to me, and now I'll speak specifically as a Jew, right? The first risk is that power is always a risk, right? Power corrupts. You could argue that everything in the Hebrew Bible is about the just use of power. That mm -hmm. power could be political power. Mm -hmm. It could be the power in a relationship between two lovers. It could be the power in a relationship between a business person and a customer, right? right? Jewish law is arguably a, an architecture 
designed to help us understand Everything. the just use of power. Right. Right. It's present in every exchange. Yes. Correct? Okay. Um, so that's clearly a challenge that these mm -hmm. cultures face. And the complexity from the other side is that Jewish history teaches me never to romanticize powerlessness. Ah. Oh, this because is really Because powerlessness good. also leads to evil. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not my evil. Mm -hmm. Right, but the, the evil, evil of one who would take advantage me. of my powerlessness. Yes. So I think it's very important in Jewish thought and Jewish history to understand that powerlessness is not a virtue. Hmm. And that makes the challenge of the just use of power right. all the more pointed. Very good. So I think that in Israel, um, look, I'm, I'm not the greatest fan of the present Israeli administration. Um, it is a it is an instrument of politics. I'm not sure it's an instrument of Judaism. It's an oh. instrument of politics. Right. Um, but I do think that in any, for any of us as individuals, as subgroups, as religious subgroups, you, you could say it of Temple Emanuel. Temple Emanuel to some extent enjoys a dominant position in the Jewish community of Dallas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We have to be very thoughtful every day yes. about not being presumptuous, about not being arrogant, yes. about being alert to our flaws about being supportive of other congregations and communities within the Jewish community, right. that with that historical, I'm not saying it's earned or deserved, but with that historical position comes a certain level of responsibility. Yes. Um, but I think you're absolutely, look, uh, what is it? Leviticus 25:23. In the thing about, you know, you shall not sell the land beyond reclaim, God says, for the land is mine. Mm -hmm. um, imadi, because you are uh, strangers resident with me. Yes. Now, what does that mean? Right? right. And you've taught me, I remember early on, mm. there was a potential flirtation between a uh, city government organization and the clergy of the city, and you mm. said to me, we have to be careful lest we get too cozy with the ruling power. Right. And that was right out of Leviticus. Right. Right? Exactly. What does it mean to be in the world but strange enough to the world and stranger enough in the world that we don't get seduced by its powers? Yes. And that to me, that my dad's language for that, may he rest in peace, was that a Jew should always stand, and because he was of the reform denomination, he believed deeply in our engagement in the world. Um, he said, a Jew should always stand with one foot in the world and one foot at Sinai. Nice. That we have to have enough remove, yes. enough of what you have called critical distance. Right. To be able to right. see things and name things, yes. but to do it in a language that still has us in the world. Right. It seems to me that the risk of the power seduction that you describe for any mm -hmm. one, anywhere, any religious group, any right. political power, is that we forget the foot at Sinai. Right, and so looking back in terms of the trajectory of uh, Israel's history, you have a foot at Sinai, but you also have a longing for the promised land. Correct. You know. Correct. So we are people on the move. We, we, we have to maintain a sense that we have been given a way of life to live as we have a sense of homelessness in the world. Right. And yet, we there, yearn for is home. A, there is a, a yearning for home. 100%. So that, and a secure home. And a secure home, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So what happens when you cross the Jordan? Right. You know, what happens when you move into? What happens when you declare, whether in 1776 or in 1948, that this is now a secure home right. for people like us? Right. Right. Uh, how do we live with that power, and how do we understand that every nation is still temporal, mm -hmm. still provisional? Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding the promises of God that always seem to me, at least, to have a future to them that is more than the present, that, that is, is, is yet to come, you know. Uh, so that we can't just protect what is, but we are working a project. Yeah, right? well, no, and this yeah. is what you and Rabbi Nancy Kasson have written of so eloquently, yeah. the, the risks of the idolizing of nationalism. Yes. 
And I think that the in the Israeli context, um, there's a reason that we call it the Jewish state and not the Jews s apostrophe state. Yes, because we have expectations of its behavior and right. not just of its demography. Right. Mm -hmm. And that it seems to me is the right of every Jew mm -hmm. to call the Jewish state that belongs to us all mm -hmm. to those standards. The truth of the matter is it happens much more vibrantly and vociferously within the state of Israel than it does in the American Jewish community. The American Jewish community is much less interesting yes. and much more hidebound right. in its approaches towards Israeli politics than Israeli citizens are. Israeli citizens are um, loud and argumentative and it's a radically free press right. that challenges its government every single day yes um and that part of israel is the best of democracy right right the the grappling with the um tragedy and pain of the plight of palestinians mm -hmm. the grappling with the human rights of human beings who have not only a right to their own humanity but a right to their own state and determining a way to do that while keeping parties um, secure and yeah. safe right. is, and I don't say it's vexing as a way of dismissing the problem, I say it's vexing as a way of insisting on the problem, right. um, is a source of tremendous pain and provocation. And any Jew who's paying attention, regardless of their position, right? They mm -hmm. could be as, um, supportive of the present government as they wish to be, what's clear is that the problem can't be denied, and any approach to it, because it is a Jewish state and not just a Jew's state, has to be morally justifiable. Wow. So I want to go back to this, this notion of what it is to live in a culture where we are uh, one foot at Sinai and one foot in, in the world. We, we like to, as Christians, we like to say, in the world, but not of the world, Right, you might say. Well, right. and I, t Christ in culture, Christ above culture, Christ there with culture, that Thank whole. you, Richard yeah. Niebuhr. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think there's a distinction. Uh, a friend of mine who works with refugees said uh, that um, what, what we try to do is to help refugees become integrated into the culture without assimilating into the culture. Nice, yep. And I think the distinction between, um, it, it for, for us as, as religious people as well, is integration means that we're engaged, that we acknowledge that we're part of this body politic, and we're going to bring our faith to it, our values, our convictions, and we're going to be patriots in that very important sense. But we are not going to blindly salute and become part of a culture that departs from the spiritual values that we have, the, the re religious identity that has to be preserved generation to generation, uh, or there's some deep loss for the larger society, not just for us. Correct. Right? Yeah. No, correct. It's the sort of you know stew pot versus melting pot idea. Yes, that, we have good. To, that there has to be some not just some, significant preservation of integri integrity, of distinctive message, of right. distinctive mission, even as our own adherents would argue about what that distinctive mission is. Of course. Right, and there would be diversity of, of voices there, but to be able to bring it, um, and to be able to bring it without fear. I, I do think that one of the effects of attacks on religious institutions, whether those be a horrible shooting in a church or a horrible shooting in a synagogue is that it brings a measure of fear mm -hmm. to that next moment of possible mm -hmm. self-expression or self-assertion in mm -hmm. religious terms. Right. The toll is ne the toll of deaths is itself devastating and eternal whatever the number. Right. But that's not the end of the toll. The toll is not limited to the body count. Right. The toll is for in a Jewish community, the toll is the next March when a family is deciding whether to send their kids to a Jewish preschool. Right. And they have that moment of hesitation. Yes. And they have a conversation at the kitchen table they wouldn't have had ten years ago. Right. And they wonder. Right. Or they wonder about the kid on the field trip. Or they wonder 
Orthodox Jews who who are accustomed to in the United States wearing religious garb publicly, yes. there isn't an Orthodox Jew who goes to Paris and doesn't put on a baseball cap over their head covering. Wow. Hmm. So what does that do? Yes. And what does that say about the culture that we're creating? My dark joke about it is that the ultimate goal of anti-Semites may not be to kill all of us, it's just to get us to spend all of our synagogue budgets on security so we don't have anything left to Oof. teach people Torah. Wow. Okay, well, we need to put a comma here because we have another episode that, uh, to continue this conversation, but this is just getting started. This is terrific. David, thank you for all the wonderful relationship we've had over time in these conversations. I'm glad we're getting to share it a little more broadly through Good, good God. We're glad to have you. Thank you, George. You bet.